Astronomers have discovered a third interstellar object. NASA's missions are being prepared to be shut down. The most massive white dwarf has been found, and its space bites plus a capsule containing human remains and cannabis seeds crashes into the ocean. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Well, we knew it was just a matter of time, but it looks like the third interstellar object has been discovered. And the discovery was made on July 1st by the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS. And you know, a lot of comets and asteroids are named after ATLAS because it's such a prolific hunter. And then it was confirmed on July 2nd by the Deep Random Survey. And it's been given its official name, 3I Atlas, or C 2025 N1 Atlas. And the C is very important because that means that it's exhibiting comet like behaviors. And so, like Oumuamua, well, did Oumuamua have comet like behaviors? Anyway, like Borisov, it is behaving a bit like a comet. And so, you know, we're still early days and people are still trying to figure out what's going on with this. But from those initial observations, we know that this thing is screaming through the solar system. So its eccentricity is six. And the way eccentricity works is anything up to one means it's part of the solar system that anything above one means that it's on an interstellar trajectory. And again, six is very fast. In fact, it's been clocked at 60 kilometers per second is the pace that it's currently moving. Now, what's really exciting about this is that we're seeing this as it's inbound. So it's currently out at around the orbit of Jupiter. And then by October, it will get within 1.35 astronomical units of the sun. And then it will continue off out into the solar system. And like, I know you're thinking like, oh, could we somehow do an interceptor? Can we get close up pictures? We don't have a lot of time and nobody is ready for this. But it's going to come within 0.2 astronomical units of Mars. And there we've got the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has a pretty big telescope on board. And the comet will only be about 11th magnitude, so well within its capability to be able to observe. And so obviously, the world's telescopes, space telescopes, and even Mars telescopes are going to join to help study and understand this interstellar object. We are just three days after its discovery. And so I'm sure this is going to be a big piece of news for the next coming weeks. We've got all the breaking information coming from David Dickinson, who wrote a great story on Universe Today. So check that out. And then I promise next week we'll give you updates and there'll just be more and more updates as we go. Yeah, once Vera Rubin comes online, then more interstellar objects won't be that interesting. One every day, one every week. Now we've been reporting on the budget cuts to NASA. And this is just part of the larger science cuts that are being made by the White House administration. Now, we, we're not at the end state yet. So we're still in the process. And so we reported on when the White House provided its skinny version of the budget, and then they provided their full budget request. And then Congress took a first crack at it. And now it just recently passed in the Senate. And now it's going back to Congress, where the House has to do a final vote on whether they're going to go with the bill. And there's a whole lot of stuff in this bill. But specifically, we're looking at these cuts made to NASA that cut its overall budget by about 25%, but make a lot of cuts to what's happening with the science missions. If this goes through, we're going to see about half of NASA's science missions affected. We'll see 41 cancellations, 17 missions are going to get zero funds, and then a lot of other missions are going to get big budget cuts. And, you know, we're looking at the loss of the Mars sample return mission, the missions to Venus, but then existing missions like Juno, which is like a perfectly operational spacecraft and gives you incredible pictures of Jupiter, New Horizons, which is ready to observe another object in the Kuiper belt, Chandra X-ray Observatory, like the list goes on. And like what's actually going to happen is still in flux. But we've learned thanks to some reporting from Eric Berger at Ars Technica, that NASA officials are now requesting shutdown plans from the people who are responsible for these various missions. And they want to see these plans by the 9th of July, which is just a couple of days. Now, this is apparently just for planning purposes. But if this budget goes through, then these will be enacted and be the real thing. The new budget needs to begin on October 1st. And so within the next three months, 
we should see a lot of these missions get shut down and canceled. Of course, we're still in this state of flux. We don't know exactly what's going to get canceled. And I promise you, as each mission gets canceled, I will let you know specifically what science we're going to be losing. So then you can understand what are the ramifications of what's happening. And again, check out Eric Berger's reporting over at Ars Technica. One of the missions that we were a little worried about is the Roman Space Telescope. It looks like that one is probably safe, but we don't know yet still. Like I can't say things are safe and I can't say things are canceled. So anyway, Roman. <laughs> But they're still moving on, uh, working on various tests. And the last big set of tests they did were the shake tests. And this is where they take the components of the spacecraft and they put it on a shake table and then they move it through the different frequencies of vibrations that those components will experience on the rocket, you know, from the initial launch through to various parts of the flight. And then they'll push it beyond the limit. They push it to 125% of the level of these vibrations to make sure that, you know, no screws pop loose, that everything is able to handle that level of a vibration load. And so the tests apparently went really well. And so now we've got more tests, vacuum tests, and then integration tests, and then shake tests on the integration tests. And hopefully, if all goes well, we will see a launch of Roman in 2027. And you can read a story on that by Andy Thomas Wick. Now we've talked a lot about the Trappist one system, you've got seven Earth sized worlds orbiting around a red dwarf star, some within the habitable zone, it's relatively close. It is the dream system to study by telescopes like James Webb. But there have been a lot of other Earth sized worlds orbiting within the habitable zone of a red dwarf star. And one was recently discovered called Gliese 12 b. And this is about 40 light years away. It's about an Earth sized world, maybe like 70% of the Earth orbiting within the habitable zone of a red dwarf star. And what makes this one interesting is that the red dwarf is quiet. Most of the time when we see these red dwarfs, they are very active with incredibly powerful flares. And of course, the planets are huddled up close within the habitable zone of this red dwarf star. And so they're experiencing enormous amounts of radiation. But this is an example of an Earth sized world that is orbiting a red dwarf star, but it's not taking on these flares on a constant basis. And this is what's expected to happen as red dwarfs age, then they settle down and they don't produce as many of these catastrophic flares. And so if a planet can survive that process, then maybe then it can have life start to form on it. And so the planet was analyzed by the Maroon X instrument with the University of Chicago, and it works on the radio velocity method where they measure the effect of the gravity from the planet as it is interacting with the star. And this is the same instrument that was used to help analyze the planets that were found at Proxima Centauri. So just another cool planet around a red dwarf star within the habitable zone. We've got a story about that from Lawrence Tugnetti. And sometimes if you want to study an exoplanet, you're going to need some help. And so in the case of the planet TOI 4465b, you've got a planet that takes 12 hours to transit across the face of its star. And this is really exciting. It's a warm Jupiter, something that has several times the mass of Jupiter. It's much hotter than Jupiter, but not like full on hot Jupiter. And this 12 hour transit time is a problem because nobody can get 12 hours of uninterrupted sky time to be able to watch throughout the entire transit. And so astronomers teamed up with citizen scientists who broke up the job. They would take turns observing the brightness of the star as the transit was happening from their location on Earth. And so while one part was lost in the glare of the coming sunrise, the next team still had darkness. And so they were able to continue the observations. And then they were able to put these observations together from all these different teams and really characterize this exoplanet. It just shows you how astronomy is one of those scientific fields where citizen scientists, regular people can still play a regular role. We've got a story about this from Carolyn Collins Peterson. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner was big surprise. 
Vera Rubin is now online and we got to see the first pictures. But it was a tough week because we also had the announcement that the Lisa mission is moving forward. And so I understand why Vera Rubin won and also why some people were pretty torn. But we will put a new vote for this week's episode into the post tab here on our channel. So go and check that out and vote for the story that you thought was the best. And then we'll talk about the results next week. Of course, the best chance, subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, train the algorithm, do all the things. A white dwarf is the degenerate remnant that is left after a star like our sun dies. And so really what's happening is you've got this hydrogen being turned into helium at the core, surrounded by all of these outer layers. And then as the star runs out of hydrogen in its core, it switches to helium burning, and then it's starting to make heavier elements like oxygen and carbon. And eventually, it no longer has the mass and the temperature to be able to keep the fusing process happening. It has become a red giant, it bloats out, puffs out a lot of its outer layers, and you're left with the core of the star. And that is a white dwarf. Then that white dwarf cools down to the background temperature of the universe. And so for the sun, when we have that white dwarf, it's going to be about half the mass of the sun. But we know that white dwarfs can continue to receive mass to steal material from binary stellar partners when they can get up to 1.44 times the mass of the sun. This is called the Chandrasekhar limit. And this is the maximum mass that a white dwarf can have, then they explode. And that's a type 1a supernova. They're very useful for examining distance in the universe. And so astronomers are always on the hunt for the heaviest white dwarf because there is this fundamental limit. And it looks like astronomers have found the chonkiest white dwarf at 1.29 times the mass of the sun. And the white dwarf is actually pretty old and astronomers estimate that it is almost fully crystallized. You've probably heard me talk about how white dwarfs when they do fully cool down, they become giant diamonds. And so this one is 99% crystallized. And what's amazing is that astronomers were able to determine all of this information purely through pulsations coming off of the surface of the white dwarf. And if you want to learn more, there's a story by Andy Thomaswick. Quasars are actively feeding supermassive black holes, but you know, not all supermassive black holes are quasars that sometimes they're quiet. But early on in the universe, everything was packed together a lot more tightly. And so we had a lot more quasars, especially during cosmic noon, which was a few billion years after the Big Bang, when the universe was at its most active point, the most star formation was going on. But each supermassive black hole and the galaxy that's surrounding it, it's its own special island. And so you wouldn't expect to see them clumping up. And yet this is exactly what astronomers have found. They found a group of 11 quasars all roughly within a few megaparsecs of each other. And that's astronomically speaking, very close. And it's being seen at a time when the universe was about 10.5 billion years old, which is a lot after that cosmic noon period. And so is this just random chance? Like, you know, what are the chances of you finding a bunch of quasars nearby each other? You know, not zero. Uh, so one possibility is just a fluke. The other possibility is that there's some kind of interaction that maybe there's a large amount of gas and dust and these quasars are forcing material towards each other that is causing their black holes to feed and they're, I don't know, like hunting like a pack, which is kind of a cool idea. And we've got a story by Andy Thomas about that. And finally, here is a really cool set of pictures. And these were taken by the Chinese Tianwen-2 spacecraft. Now this spacecraft launched a little over a month ago, and it is headed off to asteroid 469-219 Kamo Olewa. I gotta get better at saying this. And it's going to retrieve a sample and bring that back to Earth. And then it's going to fly off to Comet 311P Panstars and then continue on its observations there. So it's going to retrieve a sample from an asteroid and then also examine a main belt comet. But on May 30th, just shortly after it had launched, it turned back and took this picture of the Earth and then this picture of the moon. But I always just really love these kinds of pictures where some spacecraft turns back, shows our home, right? There's the pale blue dot version, of course, but much higher resolution images. You know, as Carl Sagan said, that's it. That's everyone right there. Everyone who's ever lived and died is in that picture right there.
And it took this picture when it was 590,000 kilometers away from the Earth. But of course, it's been traveling now for 33 days. And so it is 12 million kilometers away from the Earth and on its way for that first asteroid encounter. We've got a story about that by Matt Williams. We've got a lot of stories here in Space Bites, but this is just a fraction of all of the space stories that we are working on at Universe Today, which is the web based publication that I am the publisher of. For example, how you can track plastics leaching into rivers from space. So astronomers are able to use Earth observing satellites to measure the reflectivity of plastic particles as they're making their way down into rivers. We've got a story by Mark Thompson, how galaxy clusters have been surrounded by high energy particles for a long time. Astronomers have observed these high energy particles surrounding galaxies early on in the universe. And now it looks like they're seeing this at more recent times in the universe. And there's a story by Carolyn Collins Peterson, and how the oceans on Enceladus are highly alkaline. We know that there are oceans of water under the ice on Enceladus and they're blasting into space. And now astronomers have measured the pH of these plumes of water and found that they're a lot more alkaline than anyone was expecting. And there's a story from Lawrence Tugnetti about that. If you're enjoying the show and you want even more space news, we've got a longer version of Space Bites that we release over on Patreon. That's Space Bites Plus. And this week's bonus is all about how a spacecraft carrying human remains and cannabis just crashed into the ocean. I'll put a link in the show notes. I had a recent question about how we handle the live streams versus the overtime versus QAs over on Patreon. And I thought I would just address that here as well. But first, I'm going to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Bailey Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Sai Nielsen, David Gilton, David Mass, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monto, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So Jack Lee in the chat over on Patreon asked about how we handle the live QAs and how we edit them and how we break them into overtime. And I just want to clarify this. Um, because I know it's I get these questions all the time. And it's more complicated than it should be. And the heart of it is that YouTube algorithm really punishes very long videos that don't get a lot of watch time. And so my live QAs that I do every Monday are two hours long. And for people willing to be there live, that's great for, for people watching it after the fact, you're going to get large drop off times during a two hour live stream because I don't know, it doesn't have flashy videos. And so we make them unlisted after we complete the live stream. And if we didn't, then they, they would be like a boat anchor that we'd be pulling the whole channel down. But we still want to make this material available to you. So first, we cut up the live show into four pieces. There is two question shows that we publish here on YouTube, we usually do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we do two overtime segments that we post over on Patreon. And that's all the remaining material. Chad edits the question show and Anton edits the overtime show. On Tuesday, when I post the QA here on YouTube, I will also do a version over on Patreon. And on the Patreon version, I'll put a link to the full unedited QA. So if you just want to watch the whole thing as it happened, there will always be a link over there. And then we also post the overtime segment for that half of the question show. And so you can get between the question show and the overtime half of the show. And then on Thursday, you get the other half of the show, the question show. And actually, we do the longer version, right? The Q&A plus that's available for free over on Patreon, you don't even have to subscribe. I always put a link to it in the question show here on YouTube. And so you can access it there. The edited overtime is the part that's only made available to the patrons. But if you do want all of that content, I still put that link in the Tuesday episode of the question show. So I hope that all makes sense. I know it's like a little complicated. The simple thing, follow us on Patreon for free, you don't have to pay anything. And then you will get notifications of all of these shows as they come out. All right, we'll see you next week.